Hi. So, thanks for coming all from dinner so soon. We are having here a panel on participating in research projects. So our main goal is actually to give you an insight in our experience in um, how we work in EU projects, mainly because most of us have this experience. Dario will also extend a little bit on uh, the role of the research committee. And we'll make just a very quick round of introductions and then actually let you ask questions. So um, let's just go in the order that we sit here, for example. Yes, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Dario. I'm a um, research analyst with the strategy team uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation. I started with the foundation uh, about three months ago. And before that, I was a, a researcher in cognitive science and social computing based in the UK. And uh, um, yeah, and I've been working for, for a while under uh, FP7, actually even <coughs> FP6 uh, uh, funding. So. Well, I'm Marco Schwart. I'm on the board of Wikimedia Netherlands. Um, we got involved in one European consortium about two years ago, COSIGN, and uh, we experienced that for a volunteer organization there are lots of difficulties involved. But I guess we get on that later on. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, Amit Bonner. Uh, I work for the University of Amsterdam and also for the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. I discovered my name on the board after uh, this lunch break. Uh, nice surprise. And uh, I don't come from the, the wiki uh, media world, but from the research world or the software that's the world. I give that angle here. Hello, my name is Angelika Adam. I work for the German chapter, and I started my work in March of this year, and Wikimedia Germany is involved in a big research project called RENA. Um, we talk about that in the later speech after this part. Yeah. Hi, I'm Matthias. Um, I work at Wikimedia Germany, uh, so-called liberating content. Um, and as a side project of um, my work, I went to um, a few meetings um, preparing for the consortium um, application for Render. Um, and since, now, since then, I've slowly faded out of the project itself, but um, I'm still committed to the project, um, of course. And I'm Danny Vrandicic. I was a Wikipedia and long before I started in research, during my studies still, and um, being now at the University of Karlsruhe, which has turned to the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT, uh, two years ago. I've been at the University of Southern California and had several research projects over the time. And I was one of the initiators of the Render project that got launched last um, year. I will give you a quick introduction. You already heard a few terms uh, be used by us. I will give you a quick introduction to some of the terminology that goes with European Union project, just so that you don't get completely too confused. So FP7, FP8, which was already mentioned, are the framework programs of the European Union. Those are hundreds of millions of euro meant for research projects. And they're... <laughs> yes, actually, yes. <laughs> and they go over um, quite a time frame. So the FP7 started in 2007 and is meant to go until 2013. FP8, which is actually officially called Horizon 2020, um, will start in 2013 and go to 2020. And I think it has a few billions of volume, actually, over the year. And the idea is that they have in more or less regular um, uh, points of time, they have those calls for new project proposals. And then you have to look at the actual texts um, in their proposals. They're all open to the website. You can all download them, read them. And they have certain objectives in those. And you have to fit into the objectives. They're looking for a specific call. And those calls then have a volume of a few hundred millions usually. Um, and break it down into the objective, objectives where you have volumes about 20, 30 million, depending on the call or the objective. And then you can make different project types into it. They are, uh, the, the one that I mentioned here are FET projects, which is usually for crazy, wacky ideas that um, are really for um, foundational research. Then there are straps and IPs, which are um, meant as collaborative projects going for a specific goal. 
straps are a bit smaller but um, and are more driven by an idea, whereas IPs are a bit bigger, usually around 10 million, about 10 partners, um, and are driven by an actual integrated um, product that you come up with then. And there's the so-called NOE, the Network of Excellence, which is a less, which is more a connection of people that are sharing the same topic, and it's more about having them interchange to stuff. So those projects usually have several partners, at least three from three different countries um, of the European of the FP7 framework, which is not only the European Union actually. So countries like Croatia have signed um, those uh, things as well. Countries like Israel are also partners in FP7. Yes, and you, they can join those projects just as like any other European Union project. So FP7 is a bit bigger than the European Union. It is also possible to get external project partners into those projects, but this is sometimes a bit hard and shaky. You have to figure out if it's really wanted in this particular call and objective. The consortium should be also looking at things like geographic spread, so you shouldn't have only 10 partners coming from the north of Europe. Um, you should look at the topics they cover and the type of partners. Is it an SME? Is it a big project? Is it a big company? Is it a university? Is it a research institute? And so on. So you should have a healthy mix of those kind of things. And then you have different funding um, agreements depending on what you are. So universities get a bit more funding, like 75%, than like big companies only get 50%, and so on. And it's actually one of the traps that we fell into with the Render Project. The projects take around two to four years. It really depends on the project itself. And you have the difference when you see the numbers, how much they actually cost in EU contribution, which is the money that you get from the EU, and the actual project cost, since we don't fund, since the European Union doesn't fund everything, it is obviously that the projects have a bigger volume than what you get from the European Union. Down there you find a link to the actual document for the next few calls and you can Google it by just looking for ICT work program. So this is a quick overview about the terminology used, and I hope I completely confused you now. Um, I don't hope, but I expect actually that you are a bit confused right now. Um, so I'm not sure how to actually proceed now. Should we go for questions immediately, or do you want to make a statement first about stuff? I just you have questions, to, yes. Yeah, I just want to add, uh, maybe Yes. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, now it's actually working, yeah. So uh, the lifelong learning program that would be also, I think, for uh, every uh, any projects kind of focusing on learning. They're kind of split up in different age groups. You have stuff for uh, adults. You have stuff for uh, younger uh, people. You have stuff for 50 plus and older. Um, AAL is uh, some kind of a joint program taken from FP7. Uh, it's uh, focusing on senior citizens. Sometimes you can be lucky to get uh, a, a call which is actually fitting your intentions. Uh, and I think the biggest ch challenge you probably will face is to gather the, the different partners uh, which are required uh, for, for your call. But I think uh, working with different chapters in Europe uh, is already kind of facilitating it. Uh, because you you already have a, a, a kind of a community with uh, common values uh, and you're already covering uh, usually the three or four uh, countries which are required uh, in EU programs. Um, so are there any questions for now for understanding the whole thing? Otherwise I would go for having the chapters to give quickly their experiences with the projects and then we can go into more questions. But here's one. Just a small stupid question. You, you've explained some, some of the terminology. Uh, in the title, there is research. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, research, I mean, like answering questions that you don't know the answer yet. Um, um, you want to explain what we mean with research? <laughs> yeah. um, so, well, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> 
So it's, it's usually about solving problems where we don't know the solution yet and or about figuring out questions to answer so we don't know yet. I mean, And one exception is the FET where we don't know the question yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, basically. Um, if, you, if, you, if you know the, uh, the answer in advance, so the usual rule is if you know the, the answer in advance and you could just go develop it, then it's not research, it's just development. And this is not what, we, what the European Union wants to fund. They really want to fund stuff that most companies won't tackle because it's high risk. Does this make sense? Well, I think in practical terms, it's very important to realize that the European Union expects proposals carried by professional research organizations, be it companies or be it institutes. Yes, That's so probably... Um, thank you for asking the question I asked you to do. Uh, you can get the five euros uh, later. Um, <laughs> No, because this is the lovely question uh, I, I've been waiting for. Um, in the Render Consortium project, there are so-called use case partners. So there are um, research partners. They do research by whatever definition. Um, they develop stuff, and then they deploy it, um, and they need a use case partner for this. In the case of Render, there are three use case partners, um, and that's we have three people, so the first one is? <laughs> so it's um, Wikimedia. Google. Telefonica. <laughs> yeah. Um, and these are independent use cases. So the, the level of interaction between Wikimedia and Google and Telefonica is lower than the interaction between Wikimedia and the KIT or Telefonica and um, JSI, um, which is an acronym for the... Um, Institut Josef, Josef Stefan in Ljubljana, um, Slovenia, right. <laughs> the country where there's love in the name. Um, does it answer your question? So, so just as a minute. Um, all right. Do we have slides? We actually have a whole talk about random just after this one. <laughs> Give a quick 20 sec seconds uh, introduction to what Render is. Render is about understanding diversity on the web. So this means um, to look into how diversity is represented, especially in the use cases like Wikimedia, and to see how diversity in Wikimedia in Wikipedia can be better used and better um, made accessible. There is a pattern evolving because also Wikimedia Netherlands is partner in as an end user and together with Deutsche Welle and uh, the Dutch Institute for Sound and Vision. Uh, and the other partners are four research institutes, which I will not name. Cosign, I'm not going to explain. Amit has given a brilliant uh, presentation of it earlier today and you can find it if you click on the, the schedule of this uh, Wikimedia and you can find what he told so you can find out what the project is. But we were also asked by the other partners, and the interesting part involving Wikimedia, Wikimedia for the other partners was twofold. One is, of course, we are end users, and we represent a very broad end user base. And the other one is, of course, we also represent a kind of public interest, far wider than the normal commercial interest, and the European Union liked it. As a re additional remark, um, being a use case partner is a slightly more comfortable position because there are less people depending on, on uh, how you work. If you are doing the research and you, you fail, that means no one else can develop and deploy stuff. But if someone else has done research, they have achieved their goal. If someone does the development, they have achieved. And then if deployment fails. It would be a shame, it would be a pity, it shouldn't happen, but it wouldn't stop anyone else from accomplishing the work patterns. 
roughly set. Um, so if you are a representative from a chapter uh, in, in FP7 country, um, so you know, but now it's larger than the EU, um, it might be interesting for you to look specifically at use case partner scenarios um, if this is the first time uh, you're considering uh, taking part. In upcoming things, moving slightly more to development and uh, research might make sense. It um, might help you in, in various other parts, but being a use case partner for the first time um, might, it is my experience, might make things easier um, and, and thus help you in kind of damage and, and risk control. So um, just understand what's the point of the whole session is basically that we want to display to other potential chapters the possibility that you can actually join those European Union projects and get money from them um, to do some research. So that's, a, that's the idea. And we want to tell you about our experience that we had there so that you can decide if it makes sense for you, under which circumstances it, make, it may make sense for you to actually join. How many representatives from chapters do we have here, actually? Okay, so it's not that much anyway, but, but spread the word at least. Um, <laughs> and um, with the German chapter and the Dutch chapter, we have actually two representatives here that are very different. The German chapter is quite a professional organization already. They have people hired to pay them, they, they work for them, and, um, but <laughs> you're a laughing. Um, and um, which means that it's actually kind of easy to become an official partner because you need some institution that actually can get European Union money and it has to fulfill certain conditions which wasn't that easy in that case, actually. Um, but if with other chapters, like the Dutch chapter, it becomes more interesting because they, they, are, they are in the phase where they are volunteer, where actually all their work is volunteers. They're not paying anyone to work for the Dutch chapter. And actually, I would be interested in how the heck did you achieve to become a partner in a European project with that kind of structure? Um, so let's go for that first, yeah. The nice part was, of course, that the initiative was on the University of Amsterdam and they first asked the Wikimedia Foundation. But the foundation says, well, we are not going to partner in European community projects. So they suggested, well, maybe you could go to the chapter in the Netherlands and they did. At the moment, we were still uh, evolving ourselves and um, we were just in time becoming a legal entity because that's one of the prerequisites in order to be able to participate in such a consortium. So if you're not yet a legal entity, you have to take care of that first. And then secondly, we had at the time no one uh, we employed. At present we do have one, but at then, then we did not. So it was lots of work. And my advice would firstly be only take part if you're asked. Don't try to set up uh, uh, such a program yourself. Probably even the German <laughs> chapter would not manage that. It's tons of work and it's lots of money where you become responsible for. But if you ask as a use partner to, to take part, expect still that you need some volunteers, which a lot of time, because the European Union is not used to work with volunteer organizations. So they simply ask you to show up in Luxembourg for a meeting of two days. If you're in a consortium with professional partners, they uh, have meetings during weekdays, uh, during working hours, and not every volunteer can make that. And especially the bureaucracy in FP7 is impressive. You need to fill in lots of forms. They are the Information Society Directorate, but everything needs to be in paper and in manifold. So you spend lots of work doing things you haven't done for years, uh, using the postal service. <laughs> well, but you need to do this work if you want to participate. The fun side is, yes, you get interesting stuff. And what we made especially a point of is we want to be the result open source. And that was, I think, especially important for our movement that the results become publicly available. Maybe after uh, scaring everyone off with, <laughs> with the bureaucracy, which is good, uh, say a couple of words of why, why Wikimedia chapters are an interesting partner for this type of research. So I, I will start by saying that the, in general, the, the general framework of, of this research goes, uh, the subjects are any type of research uh, you can think about. 
um, medical or, or whatever, but we, we are sitting in a subcategory of ICT research. And within the ICT research, what uh, other sub, the sub subcategory would be of the natural language processing uh, type of research. So anything to do with natural language processing, these are usually algorithms or programs that use uh, machine learning uh, uh, techniques. Machine learning techniques, it means that computers read enormous amount of data and try to find patterns or learn something from this data in order to come up with some smart decisions. Um, in our case, it goes about content synchronization and translation and these kind of things. Now, um, Wikimedia has become, in the research world, the, one of the most attractive sources of uh, training data, of data. There, it's open and, and computers can read this data and people, you cannot believe how many papers are published about, Wikimedia, about Wikipedia uh, in any type of natural language processing aspect. Uh, so um, when a new project comes up and this is this, the topic of the, of the research and those questions are usually serious challenges, so nothing is, has been really resolved. Uh, if you look forward, there will be more and more research about that. And Wikipedia is the uh, kind of the natural candidate for source of uh, information. And so this is just to, to give the whole context of why uh, Wikimedia chapter could be a perfect uh, use case partner for some university or several universities and such a corporation. about research with Wikipedia data, actually the another important thing that we have here is a representative of the, what is it called, research council? Of the research committee, Dario, and he might tell you a little bit about this actually fairly new institution that the foundation has set up. Yeah, so just to give you a perspective from the foundation, um, um, as someone said before, the foundation hasn't really uh, directly engaged in research consortia, uh, and this part of the uh, of the general model of not relying on constrained grants for funding some activities. It's a, the, the foundation is in a privileged position to have a, to be be able to run uh, out of donation. I think this is this is great, uh, and it also means that uh, it's sort of reluctant to uh, to join uh, um, research consortia that often involve a lot of constraints and and uh, and. Uh, uh, bureaucracy. But this being said, uh, we're obviously trying to do our best to support uh, uh, researchers and research collaborations. And until uh, uh, a few months ago, if you as a researcher contacted the, the foundation just to look for a specific kind of data they needed or support with your subject recruitment for uh, surveys or, or studies or uh, any kind of uh, uh, support, either institutional, technical, or financial from the foundation, it wasn't really uh, a contact point at the, at the foundation, so probably your mail uh, would get stuck at some point uh, in, the, in the mail servers at the foundation. And uh, uh, at the moment, we're happy um, to have a, a dedicated body uh, composed uh, by researchers, by uh, Wikimedia staffers, by uh, community members, uh, and that's the research committee. And uh, the research committee has been active for uh, a couple of months now, and uh, we're very happy to uh, have been launched a number uh, of, uh, um, of initiatives that we're hoping will make uh, research collaboration um, with the external community of researchers uh, much more effective. So just to give you an example, maybe I can bring up something uh, if you have a browser. So one of the initiatives that we launched uh, is this uh, research index, which is the, uh, the main go-to point for all things research uh, um, on Wikimedia. So if you go to this page, it's hosted on, on Meta, you can find uh, all sorts of information about uh, recent projects uh, that we are running or that external researchers are running in collaboration with the foundation. Uh, you'll find some documentation about resources, so how to find, uh, how to get access to the data you need, um, how to find, uh, uh, find more about uh, 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 people, uh, scholarly, uh, scholarly articles on Wikipedia, uh, 
mailing lists, discussion groups, and anything re relevant to your research. And uh, we also have a section about support. So you can find instructions on how to approach the foundation for any, any need uh, you may have. Um, and we're also trying to spearhead this idea of uh, uh, building um, a canonical directory of, uh, of Wikimedia projects. So uh, if, you, if you go to the, uh, so if you click on more at the end of the, of the section, So we have, uh, we've started to build this directory. We want to keep track of all research, not just internal research, but also research that is uh, being conducted by external partners. These of relevance to, um, to the community and the foundation. So uh, our hope is that uh, at some point we'll be able to, uh, uh, to build a corpus of research and be able to feature and uh, give more visibility to research that is, uh, uh, is being done in this framework. And uh, as part of this initiative, I should also mention that we launched uh, last month in collaboration with the, uh, with the signpost, uh, uh, the first edition of a research newsletter. Now, this research news newsletter is the first attempt at uh, covering uh, all updates uh, in research uh, from the academic community, from the uh, also research projects that are initiated by the um, Wikimedia community itself, and uh, basically to, uh, to create an outlet for people to communicate in an effective way uh, their work uh, to other people in the same community. So, if you have projects that you want, to, uh, you want us to highlight, if you have uh, research papers that uh, uh, cover topics in, uh, in uh, wiki research or specifically on wiki, uh, Wikimedia projects, uh, please get in touch with us and we'll make sure that your research uh, is uh, featured and uh, highlighted in this newsletter. Um, and again, uh, for any, uh, any question related to either policy uh, or uh, potential collaboration with the foundation, uh, look up the uh, research committee pages uh, and you should find all the information you need. One cannot stress enough what Dario said in regards to supporting researchers. Um, I used to help in the so-called OTRS um, project, which is um, answering emails sent to generic um, mailing addresses. And um, once in a while, a, um, a researcher pops up and says, look, I'm doing X, Y, Z, and can you tell me where to find a specific kind of data um, that I can use? And these are the elite of the research because they asked, um, for everyone who asks, there are 10 who don't ask and simply um, abandon research, take different um, data, outdated data, or they move to projects that have been used Wikipedia in the past to generate um, a research corpus we have no longer access to. Um, this happened in, in many aspects of, um, um, of, 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 of um, computer linguistics where there is um, data used coming from Wikipedia from 2006, and instead of taking current data, they take the ones that is available for them in a convenient manner, but then the current ones, they use it, they publish great results based on outdated information, and we no longer have access to um, the, the fruits, and there's no direct feedback coming back. So taking part in research projects is a, is a way to ensure that the research conducted has an impact on Wikipedia itself. At least there's a potential to improve Wikipedia and to make Wikipedia or to help it stay relevant um, for research. It's about the future of Wikipedia, if you might want to put it in more dramatic um, terms. Um, and this is one reason for chapters to be um, interested in this one, because in this way they can shape the future of Wikipedia in a very constructive, um, slightly indirect manner um, that also helps them to do one thing that they usually can't do is, is to, to become itself a bit more sustainable. The chapter of Wikimedia Germany and other chapters, they are mostly funded by, by, um, by donations coming in at the end of a year. So the, the money spent in January of, of a year came in in December the last year. And by participating in, um, in, in EU-funded research projects, you have a, suddenly a perspective to conduct something for the course of three years, or uh, in some cases even more or less. So this is, um, this is the changing the nature of, of a chapter in a way that they can start for the first time in their life to plan for, for a larger amount of time. Um, and 
this by itself might be one reason for participation, apart from the expected outcome, apart from the impact it has on the, the Wikimedia landscape. There was a question over there. Hi. Uh, I know something about the, this program because a few years ago I, I was a candidate for, for being a evaluator of, uh, of the, uh, in the, this program. And I still don't understand. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for me to understand how Wiki, Wikimedia fit into this, uh, this uh, framework because uh, w there are some uh, academic research that uh, we know what the goals is. There are some uh, industry companies. They want to profit from this. And also, they have, so there are conflicting goals. They're, they don't have the goals that Wikimedia have. The, uh, and besides that, you don't all, only get, uh, get money. You have to to invest. You also to invest. So where do how do the Wikimedia fit into this kind of framework? The the honest answer I can give you is we don't. Um, but that doesn't really matter. Um, Ten years ago or twenty years ago, if there was a, such a thing as an FP7 project. Um, about render, um, it wouldn't have been Wikipedia um, that would have participated as a research, um, uh, as a use case partner. It would have been Encyclopedia Britannica or Brockhaus or any other publishing group. So it's a company that would have taken our place. Companies, they get 50% um, support instead of the research partners who get 75. When FP6, FP7 were drafted, they didn't really think about organizations like Wikimedia taking part in this. We aren't a genuine research organization yet. On the other hand, we aren't a company. That means we fall between the, the slots and we end up being treated as a, a company right now, which means we get 50% instead of um, 75%. This is um, a shame. Um, this might change and there might be solutions. One um, obvious solution is that uh, Wikimedia could start a dedicated research entity whose sole responsibility is to conduct research and then it would be eligible for the 75% um, support. Um, one thing is the EU um, slightly modifies its criteria. However, the biggest threshold is, and this is um, irrelevant whether it's 75% or 50% is you have to have money in order to get money. And Wikimedia Germany would not have been in a position to take part in Render one year before we did participate in it. Um, right now, um, for all of the chapter representatives who are listening to conversation happening on public mailing lists, the foundation seems to be aware of these problems. There is a growing grant project coming up. So if you are a chapter and the one thing that keeps you from participating in such a project is the lack of resources to counter spend the, the, com the money coming from the European Union, that would be a great uh, opportunity to talk to the Wikimedia Foundation because you could make a good case that the money will be spent well and in accordance to the principles of Wikimedia Foundation and the chapter and in the end you get something done for half the price or uh, for even uh, less than you originally intended to. As long as, of course, the, the, the use case and the research is actually relevant to Wikipedia, which should be obvious um, in any case. So I'm happy uh, you brought this up because that's something I wanted to mention. So it's true that the foundation doesn't enter uh, typically into a research consortia, but uh, as you said, we, uh, we are starting now with a, a systematic approach uh, uh, towards grants. Uh, so Azaf uh, uh, is uh, the person in charge with grants. And uh, part of these grants, uh, I mean, the majority of these grants are going to chapters. But there also, there's also part of these grants that are going to uh, potentially research uh, projects. So we might, we might be able to fund uh, specific uh, uh, projects uh, going to be like a micro projects, so probably not going to be the same kind of funding that we see typically for, for large research consortia, uh, but that's definitely a possibility that uh, interested researchers uh, or community members should consider. 
And um, um, I also want to mention that we have a fellowship program. And uh, we're seeing now uh, uh, an amazing example uh, at the foundation during the summer. We're running a, a summer of research program. We have a, a bunch of brilliant uh, 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 PhD candidates that are working uh, intensively on uh, uh, studying our communities and understanding questions such as uh, editor retention, uh, editor trends, uh, and they're producing really for the first time a, a comprehensive uh, um, amount of uh, results and, and data about uh, trends in our community. So fellowships is another way in which uh, the foundation can help uh, promote some research uh, uh, from the external community. So we are running actually quite much over time, but actually I'm stealing the time for ourselves. So um, are there any pressing questions right now? Otherwise, we're still around the whole day. So you can ask any one of us to for questions yet. Just a very quick question. Um, uh, is this funding only available for EU countries? Um. FP7 member countries, which is a bit more than EU. Um, and also in some cases, even countries who are outside of uh, the FP7 partnership, like India has usually a good chance to get this kind of funding. Um, but, but you really have to look into the actual program to see if this is possible for that cases. So the, the, so the other FP7 members that are not EU, like Israel, Switzerland, Croatia, and so on, they have no problem at all. But for some countries, you need to figure out how to do it, if at all possible. So the US is usually a country that is really tough to get in. Thank you. I'm Beatriz from Argentina. I know Argentina can participate in FP7 because I already participated in two of these projects, so I can talk about the bureaucracy. Um, but I would like to ask, uh, is, it, is, this, is it the same for FP8 uh, projects? It, uh, and uh, we as chapters from South America, I would really like to participate in this kind of uh, initiatives. So uh, my question is, how do we know who is working in what kind of things? If, if there is a, a um, how can we know uh, what plans? And if someone is making plans, uh, we can maybe try to figure out uh, how can the Latin American chapters could how, how could we participate in this this kind of initiatives? But I I can say that FP7 was a really interesting initiative. We I participated in in two of them, both related to free software. Um, I, we would like to, to let you know that we are really interested. So if you are looking for Latin American partners, contact us. Thanks. So just in short, FP8 is basically the same structure as FP7. Okay. Um, with, with regards to that. And the other thing is, actually that's a good question, like could we, is there a way that, for example, research consortia could look for specific chapters with specific, specific self-promotion, but uh, the, the, the research index is really the place uh, also for planning projects. We've seen a number of uh, drafts uh, uh, that ended up being uh, like full-fledged research projects. So uh, if you're looking for partners, you want to have some, discuss some ideas uh, uh, related to, uh, um, to Wikimedia research, please use this resource because this is basically what it's been designed for. And I wanted to uh, uh, make another point related to the question that we uh, had before regarding interaction between industry partners and uh, uh, academic partners and uh, non-profit partners. And this is something that comes from my previous experience and I wanted to mention this and ask, uh, 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 well, chapter members uh, whether they're facing any of this problem. I remember that uh, as part of an early uh, consortium under uh, FP7, I saw a lot of tension between uh, industry partners and uh, academic partners. At that time I was, uh, I was based at uh, an academic uh, department uh, in terms of intellectual property. So um, I knew that at that time uh, we were having a problem about uh, disseminating uh, in a timely way and in the most unconstrained way our results because basically the, the, uh, the industry partners were all into uh, patents and uh, you know, uh, not releasing uh, data or not releasing uh, uh, reports or, or, or results that could actually uh, um, make a, 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 a a commercial, uh, commercial application. So I want to ask uh, 
how you're facing uh, this kind of problems if you have this, this kind of problem. So in render, I can speak for that partner, so you may, can maybe something I don't call and later. In render, actually KIT drafted a consortium agreement, and from the beginning for us it was very clear that we wouldn't compromise on a few things. Like um, there wouldn't be any, um, any, that we wouldn't be tied down or not allowed to publish any of our results, that we would be going for open source, et cetera, et cetera. And the other partners had to basically they had a chance to either drop out or um, to agree. So in this case, we were just not willing to compromise on this kind of things. Do you want to add something, I guess? Um, as, as far as I know, we do have some courtesy things like um, um, giving heads up uh, for upcoming research publications. Um, and, and if I understand the, the wishes of commercial partners, some of their desires are already covered by, by courtesy behavior. Um, and since we are kind and friendly people, um, this is no, not an issue for us. No. So formally, they get, the, they get a preview of our, of our publications, and they may um, raise an issue, which we then have to cordially uh, figure out how to solve it. But they can only actually uh, veto a publication if their data is being used inside of a publication, which makes sense. And then only on this part of the publication. So whatever we do with Wikimedia data, whatever we do with only the research partners and Wikimedia data, there's no way that Telefonica or Google may interfere and say, you cannot publish that. Um, is there any uh, uh, restriction on um, when you do publish that it must be in a journal which is free access or not? No. So you do publish in journals which are not free access? Well, the nature of the Cosine Consortium being research institutes and uh, end users who are somewhat aligned to the public sector too, makes this problem a lot less. Where it was, we had not really to argue very hard to uh, convince everybody that it would be a good idea to make the software open source and to make the data involved open source, which is very important because in <coughs> linguistics, the data sets are a very important part of the, the power of your program. And at present, all the other initiatives are all commercial, so there are only in the end, commercial initiatives which have uh, uh, language processing capabilities, and we have no open source alternative if we are not on the watch out. So that was for us a very important strategic reason to participate, but we had did, did not have this kind of tension. On the other, the, the other way around, the European Union very much liked the concept of not being dependent on companies using their intellectual property as a means of to spreading the software, but using open source as a model. Yeah, just a, a final um, pitch for something that might be of relevance uh, uh, for, the, for the research community. Uh, we're in the process of setting up uh, uh, an open data repository. So the idea is that at the moment uh, there's data scattered here and there. Uh, data sets cannot be linked and merged to actually produce new, new research. Uh, data set cannot be cited. They cannot be permanently uh, referred to in research papers so that people cannot get credits for creating brilliant data sets. Now, to try and, and, and support, uh, actually cope with these problems, uh, the, the foundation is working towards uh, an open data repository. So if you're interested, if you have data that uh, you think are relevant for Wikimedia research, then stay tuned and, uh, uh, and you'll find out more on Wiki Research Shell on uh, the foundation's blog. Well, my closing remark would stay interested in what is happening, take part, but prepare yourself well. Well, uh, maybe, maybe in, just to, to, to say uh, one sentence on another angle, which is the relationship between research and the users. So the research needs users to support the research, but users are reluctant to use research systems because they are not ready yet. They give results which are not that good. So one of our uh, 
um, well, uh, questions these days is how to solve that one, how to get us users on board, Wikipedians, um, because this is how we can get better research results in order to give the same users a much better system eventually. And my closing words. <laughs> um, uh, take care of the organizational problems uh, you can have if you are a partner in an EU project because it's really um, challenging uh, to think about the financial reports, to think about the work package, work package reports, and uh, you have to hold some deadlines, and it's really stressful at the moment for us, and yeah. But it's a really interesting project, and I hope we will find out some really good results for Wikipedia. Anything that you have already said? Okay. So let's thank the panelists for the whole um, talk, and I hope you got some question answers. If you have further questions, just come up to us. Thanks. Okay. Now the previous talk was totally over time, and so the next talk, uh, because of the panel is taking far too long, will be much shorter than uh, planned. Um, so um, I will present together with Angelica the. Um, Render project that we already have talked a few about. Time. The idea behind Render is basically that on today's web we see a loss of serendipity, serendipity happening. So we get more and more personalized information. Um, your, you, the, the info stream that you create on Facebook, the like stream that you create can be used for personalization. Google is more and more personalizing depending on what you click, what you search before. Um, Amazon is great at, at offering you books that you're really interested in and, and getting your money. Um, but what happens is that diversity is in danger, basically, because of this kind of things. The Render Project tries to save diversity in very, we to say very dramatically. Um, so we want to develop methods, techniques, um, ways to actually represent diversity, to understand um, the diversity that is there on the web, and to make it a real asset again. To, to be able to, if you read a blog post, to show you, for example, blog posts with a different point of view on the topic. To show you um, what others have said, not the one that you have read. So that you don't fall into this trap of actually um, only seeing things the way you um, already know they are. Um, one of the favorite examples that I have is actually based in um, the Near East conflict. So the BBC had, uh, it was the very same event. The headline in the BBC was, British soldiers set free after trial. The Al Jazeera, on the other hand, wrote on the very same event, English murderers given leave. So it was, in both cases, it was about the same event. And people wouldn't even understand why the other side might be angry about stuff, because they're reading in a very different way. So Render has three use cases. One is Google, with Google News, where we try to actually, uh, um, you, you maybe have those, you have, maybe have seen those news alerts that you get, um, where you can subscribe to a topic and like every day or whenever it happens, you get an email with, uh, with news about um, this topic. And the idea is to extend those news alerts in a way that they not only show you the most popular news items, but that they actually cluster them first by bias, and then show you the most representative for each of those biases. So that you actually get different points of view on the events that happen. In Telefonica, we're trying to support the company with understanding the external input from, from customers, like um, understanding what, what's happening on Fora, what are the people pro uh, complaining about, what are they happy about, what is their diversity, to see what's happening in Twitter, to get a view on this kind of things. And finally, we have Wikimedia as a use case partner with the Wikipedia, obviously. And that's what is most close to your heart, I guess. So to give you a few numbers on render, it's a strap, one of those words that we just learned, with a duration of three years. Um, we have seven partners coming from five countries in the European Union, and with a budget of around four million. Um, budget, not EU contribution. That's the difference that we learned earlier. It's coordinated by KIT, the institute I come from, and um, a few more numbers. So on Wikipedia, we have different kinds of uh, diversity. The first one is the selection of dilemmas. Which, which, ki which 
what are we actually talking about? Um, do we want an article for each and every single Simpsons episode? Mm -hmm. is, this, is, this, is this a place in Wikipedia for that or not? Um, and depending on your decision, actually your audience will change. If you don't have those articles, well, some Simpsons aficionados maybe get uh, very unhappy and leave the project. On the other hand, if you have those articles, you may have people who say, that's all trivial. I'm not contributing to a project that's trivial. And based on this decision, you actually create a system that's self-reinforcing where you get more and more people who not only like Simpsons episode, but actually think that every South Park episode should also get an essay, who think that every other episode of TV should also get an and so on and so on. And on the other hand, um, you, get, or, or you, or, uh, you get more and more people who think it should only be elitist stuff, you know, um, only high cultural things, only, or only science or, uh, or, or this kind of thing. The perception of the project will change over time and the whole project will move in a specific direction and will develop a, some kind of a systemic bias. The other question is, let's move away from the lemma um, selection level. The other question is, the members of Muslim faith, are they, is this number identical on the Arab language, the Hebrew language, and the English language Wikipedia or not? Do those three different Wikipedias actually give you a different view on the things or not? Should they give you a different view or not? We don't know the answer to this thing. Oh, there's one thing about render we have to know. We're not solving these problems of diversity. We're just trying to find a way to get a step closer to understanding them, to exposing them, to somehow represent them. We're not creating a system where Wikipedia automatically will solve all diversity issues. This would be Nobel Prize winning, I guess. Um, we're not, we, we, don't, we know that we can't achieve this goal within three years. Um, but we hope that we can make a little step towards this direction. Um, switch that. This is one of my favorite slides, actually. What you see here is the history of one Wikipedia article. Um, this was done by the History Flow Project by IBM. So every color you see here is a different editor. And from le left to right, you see time. <coughs> So this is how the, how the article changes over time, how it gets more and more stuff inside, how, it, how the article grows. And then you get to the zigzag line over there. What's happening here? So someone deleted this pale white stuff, and in the next edit, it was added again. Then it was deleted again, added again. Sounds familiar? Deleted again, added again. Um, so we had this basically a paragraph inside the text got removed constantly and got added again. It's just, it's just a typical edit war, what you have here. And in this visualization, you actually see those edit wars really nicely. And what is this highly contentious article you're looking at? Anyone wants to make a guess? It says there? Oh, OK, it says there. It's chocolate. So there we have the paragraph on the health implications of eating chocolate, which got deleted because, hey, this is not uh, whatever. So this is just one example of what's going on in Wikipedia. I don't, give, I don't need to give you more examples of that. Um, and uh, what Angega will talk to you about you know, are the actual use cases that we're trying to implement within the three years that we have in Render. Thank you. First, I have to say I'm really nervous. <laughs> and I'm not, to, I'm not used to speak. Um, but I tried. OK. Um, we are a use case partner. Danny mentioned it already. And in our first year of our use case study, we had to think about which kind of metrics we want to measure, which are the important points of diversity within the Wikipedia. And uh, we find out it's important for each Wikipedian, Wikipedia article um, to be complete. It's one of the important things um, a Wikipedia article has to be up to date. It's really important. And um, it should be written really well and objective. These are the main points. So um, it can be neutral in our, in our understanding too. And uh, we, we defined uh, three use cases, uh, use case scenarios, I have to say more. Um, and we want to support, on one hand, um, the editors of Wikipedia, and on the other hand, the readers. And the first uh, use case we uh, defined is we want to be able 
to show a signal if a Wikipedia article has a bias in a certain direction. And we can use um, two approaches uh, to reach that. Um, one is we can uh, collect and analyze external sources and uh, collect the facts inside of these sources about a specific topic. And then we can um, compare this fact cloud, I call it, with the fact cloud of a certain Wikipedia article about this topic. It's one way to do it. Another way is to compare uh, Wikipedia articles um, in different language versions. And maybe um, you read an English article and it would be nice if on the right side of the site is a little box which shows you, oh, you're reading the English article, but you are able to speak Spanish and you are able to speak German and uh, have a look in these articles too because there are more facts about this topic. That could be really nice. Um, so maybe <laughs> we hope it could be possible we can uh, incentivize with uh, this uh, approach um, readers to be able to become an author too because we heard it um, on the whole conference if a um, reader or a person who wants to extend an article knows what is missing inside of an article it's much more easy to uh, contribute and um, we hope we could uh, offer some links to external sources, maybe with short summaries about the topic, so you know what could you add to this article to complete it. And yeah, and the third uh, use case is concerning about the up-to-dateness. Um, there we use two approaches too, or we want to use two approaches, <laughs> and. The simplest way is to look on other, in other language versions. Um, if there is a, is a very high editing process in 20 other language versions about the same topic, and in the article you are look for actually um, is, is no editing the last three or four days. That could be a hint there was an event in the world that, uses, uh, that caused this uh, high editing in the other language versions. And uh, the second approach we want to do is uh, we check external <coughs> sources um, like news streams um, to detect if there are certain uh, types of events which could be added in the, the articles about this topic. Yeah. And then we should be able to display a little warning, yeah, <laughs> uh, right lamp, you have to update your article, it's uh, out to date now. Yeah. And we have some further information for you if you are interested. We established a, a community site on Render two weeks or three weeks ago where you can find some more information about our goals. There is a list of uh, some literature uh, we, we used to find out which metrics are useful. We have a very beautiful <coughs> flyer <laughs> you can get from Danny. And of course, there is a EU page too. Yeah. So we have really pretty stickers all about diversity and we have flyers. I'll just put them at the end of the entrance. So if you want them, take one with you. And we have we don't actually have any time for questions, but we'll still take one or two, <laughs> as long as the chair doesn't <laughs> complain. Do you have any questions? This one? Actually, how limited is your tool? Because I can imagine that so taking a look on some pretty basic semantic data, like born in, died in, or uh, the president of that I that for instance you can take a look on uh, some chains of characters uh, to see stuff like that but how about more complex data and how about just checking out w what is the notable source and what is not because you know on the internet you can find just anything and a lot of weirdos I don't know believing in memory of water or some 
I don't know, sort of scientific uh, devices. So actually, how do you recognize uh, this, this buzz from, I don't know, anything useful? Yeah. Do you want to answer? Or? Okay, so basically that's a big, we don't know yet. Um, so our first idea is actually to, um, so we have this JSI partner that is really good in, in language technology. And what they're doing is doing um, uh, relation extraction and we'll be using those kinds of things to cover, to see the fact coverage. For the notability of sources, what they have developed is a media bias detector, but they can actually, if, if looking at a history of a, of a website, for example, try to figure out if this site, what's the difference between the sites and try to name those. But those are still prototypes and um, we hope that they will be good enough to actually support our tasks. Um, but that's a big, let's see. If you have any good ideas on that, we definitely want to hear about them and reuse it. Or if you have research on this, we would definitely like to use that. Any more questions? Then thanks for the attention. And let's hand over the last speaker. So while they are fixing technical stuff, I can introduce us. Um, we are not really, really part of the research track, or we shouldn't be, because this is not exactly a research project. However, we will be brief, and this will not take a long time, because we kind of figured that we wouldn't have half an hour. <laughs> We're not prepared to talk for half an hour. Uh, so if you want an insight into Wikipedia editing, if you're an academic, please stay. Yeah, and uh, it uh, feels really nice to have the last session before the closing cer ceremony. And not being a researcher, so if you're not wanting this, you're going to lock the door, so you have to hurry. Um, so, so we're from the Wikimedia Sweden chapter, and we're going to be a little bit odd, just presenting an, uh, a not perfect project, which there have been lots of presentations on this Wikimania. It's been good in many ways, but there's been a multi-layered project and we're gonna talk a little about what was tough to do and what we learned about it. So a little bit background about Wikimedia Sweden because it's needed for, for the project and some of the layers. We founded in uh, 2007 and we grew very quickly in the beginning. Have a little bit over 200 members. And we, we have been starting about talk, talking about Professor Professional, being more professional, <laughs> like Wikimedia Germany, which we look a lot upon. And so we started, obviously, thinking about we should hire someone, and but how should we do that, and what should they do? And it's a lots of bureaucracy in Sweden hiring. So we thought, well, let's get some experience first and just contract someone to do a short project. So we. So we get some sort of experience in, in doing these sorts of things. And which meant that they gave me money, which is a good thing. <laughs> we can do it like this. So, so enter .se. Uh, .se is the top level domain administrator. You can have it in top in Sweden and they are very internet friendly and they are publishing all their things in a Creative Commons license and we have been getting grants from them before doing a Wikipedia Academy. And if you go to the next control tab, they, they're having an internet fund which they let you have money if you do something and it specifically says do you want to do something for the development of internet in Sweden? And we thought, well, how is the subject, the topic of internet in Sweden on Swedish Wikipedia? It turned out it was very poor, not a lot of articles, lots of bad articles. So we 
thought we should going to do something in that area. And we have been looking a little bit about these quality assessment projects and uh, the British Museum uh, collaboration in the glam sector. And we set up a sort of a project like that. So we're thinking about hiring some experienced Wikipedian to uh, assess all the articles and start, start actually starting a wiki project. There was no wiki project. And the purpose of this was to make it easier to find good content and make it easier for editors to contribute in, in this specific topic. And since Internet in Sweden is close, to, close at heart to .se, they, they gave us some money. Okay. Next. Oh, you can take next. And, and the actual application was very easy. They have a very easy uh, application form to fill in. So we, we did that and was granted the money. And we started looking for someone. And we found a very good Wikipedia editor that wanted to do this work. So we contracted Yuan. And he's going to talk a little bit more about the specific project. Yeah. So briefly about this project. I and mean, I was hired to do kind of editorial meta work around articles relating to Sweden, internet in Sweden with the goal of making it easier to write articles relating to those subjects. We started by asking ourselves a few <coughs> questions, or mainly I started to ask myself a few questions because my contract said that I should ask myself those questions. That what it was it, it described what I should do, and um, that was a mistake. But anyway, I had to do it because I had promised to. So. What articles do we have? How good were they? Are, you know, quality assessment, as was being said. What should we do about them? And what did we lack? And finding out what articles did we have and what articles did we not have, I suppose that's the closest to the research part of this, is a pain in the ass. Because we have categories, and the categories sometimes work with you, sometimes they don't, because they're not made for being used for this project. Categorization is a very subjective thing. And someone thought that, yeah, I will categorize stuff like this and not mainly having internet in Sweden in mind for obvious reasons. So I had to find articles. I started looking through relevant categories. And I started looking through not so relevant categories, hoping to find something. Then I did random searches. And eventually, I just sat down and asked people, so. Um, do you know someone else we should write about? Something like that. And of course, this way we found articles that we should have, but we didn't have. Looking up lists like, yeah, this computer magazine has a list of the 40 most influential people in the internet in Sweden in 2007. This is not a great way to find what articles you are lacking, but we didn't have any better way. Or what are the most visited sites in Sweden, and do we have articles on them? And it turned out that in many cases, once upon a time, we did have those articles. And because we are very bad at communicating the fact that you don't only need to write relevant articles, the article has to be able to defend its own relevance. They have been deleted. <sighs> so having done that, looked up, what did we have? What could we do about it? Prioritizing, trying to find sources, making lists. We should do this, we should do that. I started trying to get other people to write because I couldn't do it myself. We agreed on that because when we launched the project, there was a discussion on the switch with the pump. And we had a few unhappy voices already thinking that, yeah, this is totally unacceptable conflict of interest. I was not going to write articles, but simply the fact that I was, I could possibly influence what we were going to write, and I got money for it. Not from a company, from a foundation, but anyway, was simply not okay. And they were vocal, but rather small minority. But the reason they were a small minority was because I was not writing articles. I think it was a talk earlier that I missed on paid editing. Uh, anyway, uh, Swedish Wikipedia, I think, is not ready for paid editing because people don't like the ID. And if people don't like the ID, as a chapter, you can't go in and do it. 
a good chapter has to work with the community. You can't work against the community, then you're not doing the job. So, did they write their articles? Well, no, not really, for two reasons. Well, first of all, if you have active Wikipedia users, they are active Wikipedia users because they have things that interest them. They want to do stuff, and they are doing that stuff. They are writing about their interests, and they are not going to change the subjects they are writing about because I come telling them, yeah, well, you know, it would be good if you wrote an article about the internet in Sweden or two. They kept writing about cars or parishes in northern Sweden or whatever was the topic. And the second reason is that this is an incredibly difficult uh, subject to write about because there are no sources. I mean, there is no academic writing on this topic. There's hardly any popular writing on this topic. There are newspaper articles, slightly written uh, press releases, and that's about it. So what did they do? Did they do anything at all? Yes, they did. If they, there were articles lacking sources where they could find sources, when it had been pointing out, yes, this article and this article and that article lack sources. If they could find sources by Googling, then they did add those. And of course, that was newspaper reports and so on and so forth, but at least we got sources. And copy editing, wikifying, that was worked best, because anyone can do that. If you are active Wikipedian, you can fix an article that lacks those parts when you, know, you need to edit stuff but you don't actually need to know the subject. So people were doing that, which is nice. But it wasn't really working. So I kind of decided to turn it into a glam-like project, and I'm sorry to talk about glam again, because it has penetrated the conference to such a degree that by now you shouldn't have to hear much about it. But anyway, I decided I should start contacting institutions and persons who were influential in the field and might have something to say about it, or could contact other people who might have something to say about it. So I did, and this has been the thing that will make this project worthwhile. I think this project will be worthwhile, and of course I will always think that this project was a good idea because it has been paying my rent. But the thing that will make this good for Wikipedia, for Switch Wikipedia, is that we have had contact with people who have previously not had contact with Wikipedia or with Wikimedia Sweden, and they are very enthusiastic. The problem is that we started doing this in the beginning of summer, and you can't do stuff. Contacting organizations, you can hardly contact private persons in Sweden in the summer because everyone is on vacation. So uh, this should be finished, it should have been finished by July 15, and it's not, because I decided to go on vacation myself instead. Uh, it was not helpful to do any work whatsoever there. So, <coughs> that is the good thing. And what did we learn from this? Well, a few things. That this may, might sound like, don't run into a brick wall, it will hurt. But then you are smarter than we are, because we didn't figure this out in beforehand. And one of the things is, you can't go and look to in, uh, English Wikipedia and go there for guidance if you're going to do a project on a small wiki. And with a small wiki, I'm talking about Swedish Wikipedia with 400,000 articles. That's one of the big, large wikis. But still, English Wikipedia, they have 50 times the editors we have. They have so many more resources, so many more editors. They have an organization that is completely different, and we can't organize in the same way if you're going to do a project, and if you want to know, is this going to work? Well, look at a wiki more your own size. Don't go to English Wikipedia. It's not helpful at all. Second thing is, having a project like this, it's a great thing, because it will help you to get contacts. It will help you to get people to talk to you. I got interviewed by the, one of the big Swedish tabloids, by Nationwide Commercial Radio Channel and by the main Swedish computer magazine. And that is some really nice coverage for a Wikipedia project. Doesn't usually happen. And if you get a chance to talk about Wikipedia, to tell, yeah, you know, and our big problem is we need more editors. And you know, anyone can edit Wikipedia and you should come and do that. If you have a chance to do that in a big tabloid, in a big computer magazine, that's a good thing. 
take the chance. And having a product like this, it's basically worth it because of those reasons only. And it's easier for organizations to work with you. It's far, far, far easier for them to have contact with someone if you're representing something that they understand. And they understand Wikimedia Sweden because we are you know, an organization, the way that they are used to. I can say that, yes, I do represent Wikimedia Sweden because the board has said that I, you know, I, I am representing them in this case. And I can't say that I, yeah, I represent Swedish Wikipedia because Swedish Wikipedia is a meritocratic anarchy. And if I say, yeah, I'm representing Swedish Wikipedia, then someone will say, no, you're not. So having a product and having a chapter to do this is a great thing. That is what chapters are good for. And the third thing is, yeah, the third thing is, if you're going to do a project to support people writing stuff, make sure that you have people writing stuff beforehand. <laughs> it is stupid to do stuff that will help people write articles if you don't have any people writing articles. Instead, you should concentrate on getting those people. That should be the main goal of the project. Yes, we want new editors. That's a fine goal. And uh, it's a fine project. And it's a good project because we have turned it more into doing that. But if you want to you know, support editing, then do that in an area where people are actually writing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of editors, but at least two, three, four, five. There should be activity. You had a question or? Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have got the money for this project to write about cars from the Foundation for Internet Infrastructure in Sweden. Uh, but yes, that is what I'm saying. If you can get the money and you should do a project like this and you don't know what subject, then do something that people are writing about. Uh, otherwise, take the money and do another project that is not about supporting editing. But do not support editing that does not exist already. And hope that since you are supporting it, it will turn up. Because uh, my experience at least says that no, it won't. You had a closing remarks? Yeah, that's Closing remarks just from our point of view as a chapter, how we thought these projects were going to go. And we're actually quite happy because we learned how to deal with a contractor and the bureaucracy about that. And we also got a really nice strategic partner. Uh, uh, and they were very happy with the deliverables we gave them because we never promised them someone will start editing. We promised them we will make it easier to join this project. So they were very happy. And having this as a strategic partner will be good for us in our bid for Wikimania 2014. So, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? You had some? A lot over here, you said? Oh, uh, so another, just a clarification question. When you were saying that um, your second strategy was to go the glam approach and to um, ask people who are influential in those areas to talk about it, what were you saying? I don't know, I, what were you meaning? Uh, I mean that, yeah, uh, so this person has a blog which is read by a lot of people who are interested in the internet in Sweden. If I can get th that person to get enthusiastic about this and point this out, then, yeah, it will help. Or if I can get an organization to get interested, then maybe they can give us some resources. Pictures, for example, we have no pictures. We can't illustrate articles on the internet in Sweden because there are a lot of persons we miss pictures of and there are a lot of subjects that are very difficult to illustrate, and it would be good if we could use some help with that. So you don't really know, though, whether that has been successful, you said, because you haven't, because you're on holiday now. Or? Yeah, exactly. I started doing that as they were going on holidays. Uh, I know that they are very enthusiastic, and we have booked meetings with them. So we are going to do stuff, and we're going to have workshops, 
and they are going to invite people they know probably are interested. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I'm really, thank you so much for sharing it because there's the very similar problems in South Africa we've been talking about where there's really small numbers of editors and, you know, like one person has been tasked with, like, changing the whole situation, which is really, really hard. But it's hard to know where to start because, you know, and you, you framed it really well. Like, what what is the best strategy? Is it about looking at the two articles that people are already interested in um, some people have used the institution strategy where to go and find institutions and partner with them in the same way that you were talking about. But they've actually found that to be less successful because the institution might give them some publicity or say, yes, we want to partner with you, but it actually doesn't result in editors joining because institutions don't edit Wikipedia pages. No. Which is why it's a nice thing that we have an institution which is interested in arranging a workshop. Any other questions? Otherwise, we are running out of time. Well, thank you very much, then. Thanks a lot. Um, just a quick announcement. The closing ceremony is going to be in Rappaport. Location has changed. <laughs>